Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us um, on today's webinar. Our topic uh, for today is keeping pace with the clinical imaging demands and the replacement of older equipment. Our speaker is Wayne Webster. Uh, Wayne is a uh, the founder of Proactive Consulting, uh, which provides a business development support for companies throughout the uh, medical and healthcare industry. Wayne brings decades of experience in the space in medical devices, pharmaceutical, medical imaging, biotechnology, and a proven expert in the healthcare marketplace. Uh, with that introduction, Wayne, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ryan, and uh, thank you all for attending this webinar. As Ryan said, today we're going to be speaking about keeping pace with clinical imaging demands, which has been difficult uh, and continues to be difficult, and the concurrent need to replace older equipment. The secondary title of this talk, and uh, something I decided to put at the beginning rather than halfway through because you probably wouldn't believe it, is how we're going to get that equipment, the equipment you need, and how we're going to keep it current without spending one cent of your capital equipment budget. It is doable. It's something that works for vendors and for users, and we're going to be talking about how we can get there and change how we're doing business. Before we really get into talking about new models, I think we have to take a look at the old model and do a little history. Uh, I'm going to take you all the way back to the turn of the century to 2000, and in between 2000 and 2007, and I'm going to look at the old model, and it was supported by plentiful lease capital. It was the same capital that was available for the housing market, which probably give you a little bit of a hint is what happened. Um, at that time, between 2000 and 2007, vendors were teaching and referring physicians to order scans, something they had not done previously, but it was driving throughput, and with the available lease capital, made it easy to justify uh, the purchase of equipment. Also during that time, reimbursement was rather steady, and people often point out specific CPT codes and say, well, this changed or that changed, but overall, over the 18,000 lines of CPT codes, um, things were pretty steady. Uh, we had increasing throughput, capital to buy equipment, and a fairly steady reimbursement base. It was really easy to justify buying something from the capital budget. In 2008, um, something happened which we all know now is named the Great Recession. And almost immediately, that lease capital dried up. We know the big hit was at the housing industry, but but the, all of that was the same pot of money that was being used to buy medical capital equipment. So lease capital virtually dried up overnight. And there was great pressure on the part of the providers, those who were providing services, to reduce spending. And that obvious target was medical imaging equipment. When you think about the cost of that equipment, how quickly it was being replaced during those years with the advance of technology and the available capital to buy new equipment, that's where everybody turned to find money for other projects because we still needed to run hospitals and clinics. So capital spending at that time was put on a short lease, a very, very short lease. After 2008, uh, we entered the period that the government started to call the new normal. In 2010, the government declared an end to the Great Recession, and we're not going to talk much about that, whether it's ended or not, but that's when everybody said that it stopped. But our gross domestic product continued to be low, which negatively impacts job growth, which impacts tax revenue, which ultimately impacts the funds available for the payment of clinical services. So we're still in a fairly low GDP, um, and all of that how we go about and work with meeting the quality initiatives and acquire equipment to do so. The capital budgets for purchasing continue to remain rather elusive. I think that anyone listening who's on the provider side who's thinking about or has gone through the process of generating a justification to replace older equipment knows that it's very difficult. And then after the 2008 end to the Great Recession came the perfect storm. 
and that is health care reform. The ACA, the Affordable Care Act, was implemented, and we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the ACA and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but just that it is, and it's had an impact on how we look at capital equipment. So let's think about what the ACA was seeking. It was seeking large quality improvements while reducing costs to deliver services. And ever since its implementation, I've thought about this. I've been in business for over 40 years, spent most of it around medical devices and pharmaceuticals. And I thought about it a lot. And I said, how do you think, always think about how do you spend enormous amounts of capital to make these quality improvements and simultaneously reduce the cost of the services that you deliver? It's pretty difficult, but delivering and improving quality is a good thing. So it drives up costs. That's what the ACA did. For good or for bad, that's what happened. The ACA also added what I call lower value patients. These are people who didn't have insurance, who now have it, who come into the system much sicker than other patients. And they are at higher cost and, again, driving our costs up. Overall, the ACA reduces reimbursement to medical centers, not for specific CPT codes, but when you look at how we're funding centers and funding them against their ability to reduce costs and reimbursing them for patient years rather than specific codes, the ACA is focused on reducing the amount of reimbursement that's going to each center because, of course, we're, if we're driving up quality and driving down costs, that should be an acceptable outcome. It also promotes a reduction in referrals for medical imaging, not directly. There's no part of the ACA that says we should do that, but again, it is an expensive place. It is a costly place to be, medical imaging. And so when people are looking to drive down costs, they naturally look to that area. The impact on capital budget funding is audible. And what do I mean by that? The mantra we hear today when we're talking to providers who are going through the process of trying to justify new equipment is no matter how well they justify it, there's no money to purchase anything. And much of that is evidenced by another reduction that we see which parallels this, which is those many people who had service contracts for their capital equipment are switching over to time and material. Um, they must be doing that in hopes of saving money. Uh, I live in the Northeast and the winter is coming and so I guess I could decide not to service my heating system in my home, but I suspect that would not have a good outcome when it didn't work and I was cold and I would pay a lot of money to get things working. So hospitals and clinics are counting on the equipment to keep working so that they can have lower cost for operating this equipment. But there's another culprit impacting capital budget funding, and we don't talk about it a lot, but it's out there. Its near-term major impact is between now and the next five years. Its back-end impact on reimbursement for the entire system is significant. This thing is costly to purchase, difficult to implement, and very difficult to train and make work. I think you probably know what it is. It's electronic health records. Electronic health records, which are mandated by the ACA, are emptying the capital budget to meet the ACA deadlines. And there's a huge push on right now for hospitals and clinics and all sorts of facilities that want to meet their deadlines to get electronic health right, records implemented. Software is expensive, difficult, not always complete, and it causes um, those hospitals and clinics to spend a lot more money than they thought, and they're looking toward the capital budget and the money that's there for funding equipment as a way to get to this ACA deadline. Technology is also causing a bit of an issue. In the past years, base technology was fairly stable. Equipment retained retain value in reconditioned markets. So when you were getting close to changing out a piece of equipment, you could trade it in, sell it, do a number of things with it, and you knew about what it was worth. In 2005, there was a transition to digital. Not everything went completely digital, but if you talk to people who are in the reconditioned equipment market and looking to buy equipment that's used, 
they will almost uniformly tell you they don't want anything before 2005. And that's not because of the age of the equipment, but there is a general understanding that somewhere around 2005 or just thereafter, equipment changed and they want to go with the newer technology. So what does it mean? Well, it, with this digital uh, transition, we reduce the value of the installed vase, which means it lowers your residual value at trade-in, and you, you probably experience some of that. It also increases the cost of new equipment. New technology is more expensive. So now we start to look at, when we're trying to justify the equipment, the clinical performance, which is sometimes not a whole lot different, versus the dollars we're going to generate. So if our revenue is staying the same and our clinical performance is staying the same, it's sometimes difficult to justify replacing older equipment with new. So a graphic representation, we have healthcare reform, the economy, revenue generation, and technology all feeding on each other. And we have the old model, which needs to be replaced by the new model. So increases in the cost of operations, increases in the cost of new technology, increases in low-value, higher-cost patients, and decreases in reimbursement, decreases in economic growth, and decrease in the value of the installed base all lead us toward a new model. So the question people often ask me is, can we sustain the old model? And we, so we look at it and we say, well, there's a budget cycle and there's annual planning and needs-based justification. And we go through sort of a, well, it's old. And the age is going to maybe justify why it needs to be replaced. It's certainly a cost to maintain. There may or may not be available equipment budget and our need for new capabilities. Remember, we're trying to keep up with the clinical demand, which is always changing. But the available capital funds and the needs justification just don't match. There's a mismatch. Today's financial reality versus the need it just doesn't come together. And that's why you're frequently seeing the rejection for replacing equipment. So can the old model be sustained? Well, Einstein is purported to have said insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. If you keep going back to the well and ask for capital funding for a $2 million piece of equipment and getting rejected, well, maybe it's time we start to think about stopping the insanity and return to some basic reality. So how do we do that? How do we adjust to this business reality that's, that we're confronted with? those of us who consult in business know is that organizations typically continue to implement solutions for problems they no longer have. Some famous uh, economist said this a number of years ago, I've seen it over the last 40 years. We continue to, we're comfortable with the solutions, it's worked before, but fortunately or unfortunately the problems are gone. So here's how we were. We went through an annual capital budget planning cycle. Why, do, why were we asking for new equipment? We were trying to keep up with competition. We worried about hospitals in the area, other imaging centers, whatever it might be. We wanted to take advantage of changing reimbursement. There were those periods where we could look at what Medicare was going to reimburse and think about upgrading our equipment to take advantage of those new areas. We certainly wanted to keep up with technology advances. And that was often key to the changing out of equipment is was bigger and better, and we wanted to make sure we had the latest. And that, of course, fed our clinical capability and mostly our competitive response to say we have a 3T MRI versus a 1 or a 1.5 helped us look better among the competition. And of course, we wanted to take advantage of a strong economy, which was feeding the capital budget and available capital. So, how are we today? Things have changed substantially. Post healthcare reform and the Great Recession, the problem or problems have morphed, but the solutions haven't still using the same old solutions. We keep trying to make the capital budget process work when the cupboard is empty. And I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but it's just the way that it is. 
Remember what Einstein said about insanity. If we keep going back and back and doing the same thing and expecting a different result, that's just crazy. So how do we get to a new solution for a new problem? First, we have to identify the problem and own it. So the first step is in our problem identification, and probably the top one is we have to meet clinical demand, and I think we'd all agree that that's changing on a constant basis. Meeting that clinical demand brings with it some other problems, which is we have to upgrade older equipment, and we have to maintain our revenue base. We certainly don't want to be putting equipment or situations in place that drives down our revenue. We should at least be shooting for keeping it stable. As part of that, we have to build a renewable equipment platform. What do I mean by that? Every so many years, you're going to need to replace the equipment, and we really don't want to go back to the old model of going to the capital budget process again uh, um, when that equipment needs to be replaced. So we have to figure out a way to build a renewable equipment platform. And what about that capital equipment budget? It's shrinking or it's shrunk. That's a big problem, and we have to solve it. And there doesn't seem to be any change in sight. We've been watching this since basically 2010, and we're six years later, and we're not seeing major change. How about administration? For the most part, they continue to implement old, implement old solutions for new problems. And that real, I don't mean that as a criticism of um, hospital administrators. They've got tough jobs to do. They're under the gun with the ACA. The deadlines to meet, they have to be funded. They still have to run the medical center. And it's really hard to go to somebody in that position and ask them to take a risk to do something brand new they've not done before. It's a difficult problem. Are they a little frightened by where we're going? I think everybody is. And as I said, they're really not ready to examine alternate paths. And I hear that a lot when I work with users of equipment who go in and talk to administrators and somehow the administrator just isn't listening to the good news that they have. It's just saying, no, there's no money. That's how we do it. We buy equipment. There's no money to buy equipment. Just keep using what you have. So what we really have to do is propose one or more strategies to grab somebody's attention. So the first thing we have to say is whatever we're going to do to acquire or get a gain access to this new equipment that we need, we must not require a capital budget. Now, that's not to say that you don't need approval for what you're going to do. Of course, you need approval. But we're not going to be looking for capital budget funding to do that. That's really important. That usually gets people's attention. Think about the fact that hospitals today, the not-for-profits, are frequently going out and floating 20-year bonds to cover the purchase of equipment that they know they'll have to replace in seven years. Does that make any sense to anybody? But to feed the capital budget, that's what they're doing, just digging a bigger and bigger hole. So we need to find a way to do this. It doesn't require that. And we must focus on clinical demand. That's what our business is. That's what we have to do. Don't worry about competition and all that. Clinical demand will drive us because that's what's changing. And we really have to work hard not to reduce revenue, but to at least keep it level, preferably have it go up and we need to gain access to upgraded equipment. We can't do any of these things if we're not using newer equipment. So how do we do that? Well, we can demonstrate the opportunity in a strategy. Our strategy is to gain access to the equipment that we need, demonstrate the clinical value from that equipment, demonstrate our ability to increase our market share, or at least maintain it within our catchment area because of the change in equipment, and hopefully demonstrate a positive impact on revenue. Now, that positive impact might be that we stay revenue neutral. And the most important one, and the one that I think people miss when you take this sort of approach, is we want to have a strategy that allows the medical center to release that capital that it would have used for capital equipment for other projects, like electronic health records, or whatever it needs. Change the focus. So how do you sell it? That's really the hard one. 
Well, you have two groups you have to sell to. You have to sell it to the vendor that you want to do it this way, and you have to sell it to administration. Both of these groups must move to the new model if we're all going to be successful. Your clinical demand needs to define the technology. And here's what we need to do within that definition. We need to acquire or get access to what you need, but never own it. Acquire and get access to what you need, but not own it, not pay for it. You need to never pay anything up front. You want access to the equipment, you want it in your facility, but you're down hundreds of thousands of dollars to make that happen. The way you can do this is by remitting a monthly payment for as long as you use the equipment. We'll give some more detail on that. And you want everything included in what you get and in your monthly payment for as long as you use the equipment. So it should be shipped to you for that payment. It should be installed. You should be trained, service, upgrades. Everything's included. Nothing else that you have to purchase. It's all right there as part of that monthly payment. I know it all sounds kind of amazing, but it actually works. And your monthly payment should be a small percentage of your monthly gross revenue. So you're generating the revenue every month that you need to make up that payment. What are the benefits of the vendor? Um, the vendor is probably the easiest one to deal with in this process. What are the benefits to them? Well, it's cash flow. A piece of equipment is in place and every month it generates some cash. That means they're turning their working inventory into assets. They're turning their inventory into working assets. Every time they put out a piece of equipment, it's sort of like an annuity. Every month they get a payment. When you're developing equipment, new capital equipment in healthcare, it's a huge risk. You need to know that when you're all done producing machines, you're going to be able to spread this over a large market and reduce that risk, your investment, if you will, for all the R&D and everything else that you had to do. This sort of a plan makes it possible for lots of centers to acquire the equipment, and so you can spread that market risk over a larger base. The vendor can actually lock up portions of the market. It doesn't have to keep working with them. If, you, if they're going to have a fixed amount of time that the equipment's there before they change it out for newer equipment, they don't have to sell you anything. They can go on and work with other, other customers they haven't sold anything to yet. They also get the ability to control the life cycle of the equipment. And they have control over that because they're updating it, they're servicing it, they know how it's being used. And that's really important to them when it comes time to take out the equipment. If it's going to go into the, the used equipment market or the secondary market, this equipment is in great shape because they've had it the whole time. How about the benefits of the clinical imaging provider? I think those are larger, but sometimes a little harder to describe. The biggest one is no need for capital budget funding. And as I said earlier, it still means you have to get permission to do this. You just can't go out and decide, well, we're not having to pay anything right up front, so we'll get a new MR tomorrow. Um, you still get permission, but you're not asking for anything from the capital budget. There's no reason to do it. You have a perpetual service contract for no additional cost. Think about the old model. The old model says you lease the equipment or you buy it outright, and at the end of the first year, if it's a PET CT or a, a large MR or some other expensive piece of equipment, you could be paying another $100,000 plus annually for a service contract. In, this, in the new model, it's included. You eliminate end-of-life declarations and the ensuing chaos, and it is chaos. All of you have... Uh, provided imaging service, have experienced the OEM walking in and saying, three months from now, we're not going to support that equipment anymore. It's end of life. You didn't plan to replace it. You don't have a budget for it. All you know is you've come to the end of the road. And the angst is pretty high. I deal with people all the time who have this issue, and we have to work through solutions. You eliminate end of life because if 
if and when the OEM or whoever sells you the equipment wants to declare end of life, they have to switch it out. So you, it's not your problem. And you maintain access to upgraded equipment by taking a small portion of a monthly revenue to pay the monthly fee. It's pretty straightforward and you always have current equipment. This model, this new model, is the next best thing to getting the equipment for free. Nothing's for free. You have to pay for something. But this is the best way to do it under the current market circumstances. So here's the reality in the marketplace. The vendor's dream is to sell equipment and be paid up front. And the buyer's dream is to own the equipment without paying anything. Now we know that neither of these positions represents today's reality or probably any other reality. But that's sort of what everybody wants to do. Everybody works toward it. And that's how we develop the old model. Now, how do you demonstrate to the vendor and your administration that the new model can work for you and provide you with the clinical component that you need to meet today's demands? For the vendor, it's pretty straightforward. The user of the equipment has to give a history of throughput and revenue consistency. You have to reduce the risk for the vendor. It's just that simple. You can't say, well, we're doing four a day now and we're projecting 20 a day in three years. That's not going to fly. We've been doing 20 a day for the last five years. Here's what we've seen for revenue. We, we're, we're projecting that this will stay level. It won't go down. It's easy to look at the history and measure the risk. Here's a big one. Choose an appropriate level of technology. Specify what you need, not what you want. All too often, I'm dealing with hospitals that are short on money with imaging departments that are asking for things that are well beyond what they need, and it's very expensive. To lower the risk for the vendor, you have to demonstrate your needs, explain why you need what you need, and stick to that area. And don't talk about this extra capacity for a very few number of patients. That's high risk. It increases the cost for the vendor and potentially increases your potential for failure. So we don't want that. We want to lower the risk with the vendor. Specify what you need, not what you want. And you have to be willing to sequester some monthly amount based on your scanning volume. And typically, we're seeing this as being in the range of about 10% or less. Not a big number considering you didn't put anything down to begin with. As we've said earlier, nothing's free, but with this approach, the vendor has a working asset and you have no upfront out-of-pocket expense. Your administration is probably going to be a little more difficult to convince. They're under the gun. They're working hard. It's difficult to take risk. Typically, administrators view owning equipment as an asset, and that's the old model. You added a lot of assets. You had a lot of overhead, and that's how you justify what you really needed overall for reimbursement. It's the old way of thinking, the old model. It doesn't work today under health care reform. It just doesn't work. What can you do to advance thinking that meets the new reality? That's a big question. How do you get somebody's attention? Well, one of the things you can do is you can provide parallels of other businesses doing what, what you're proposing. We all know what Airbnb is. It's a $20 billion valuation hotel company that does what? It doesn't own any hotels. It's a $20 billion valuation hotel company that doesn't own any buildings. Uber. We all know about Uber, uh, a $40 billion valuation taxi company that doesn't own what? They don't own taxis. They don't own any vehicles. They don't have buildings to repair them. They don't have employees, mechanics, tools, none of that. Now, why do they do that? Why don't they want to own buildings and vehicles? It's the cost of capital and the time it takes to acquire it. And there's another big one. They want the freedom to move rapidly within changing markets. And I think you'd agree that healthcare is a rapid and continuously changing market. So this fits for you. What's the practical demonstration? In business, we talk about the cost of ownership and, and potential net revenues. What's the difference if you own or just use the equipment? The daily revenue is basically unchanged. There really isn't any difference. Your operating overhead remains basically unchanged. There's some minor change in that you're not paying for a service contract or insurance for equipment you don't own. 
your net revenue in most cases, if there's good throughput, improves if you use the equipment rather than own it. So let's use, let's give an example. Let's look at a pet CK with a purchase price of a million and a quarter. That's what the vendor would like to get for it if he sold it outright. If you were going to give him cash, you'd negotiate something less. But let's use that million and a quarter number. If you would lease it, interest rate would be around 7.5%. And the, and the reimbursement for studies for the PET CT side would be around $12.95 per study. It's say eight patients a day, and you're going to use the CT alone, and that would be around $250 per study at 10 patients a day. I think you'll think of that as pretty conservative. And we're going to say that the average month has 21 imaging days. Now let's look at that example of own versus use. Gross revenue is the same, around $3.5 million. The total operating expense is different. If you own, it's a little higher because of what? You're paying for a service contract, you're paying for insurance, those sorts of things. So there is a savings there. The total annual financing, if you own, is over $300,000 a year. I said $20,000 if you use, try, again, trying to be conservative, assuming that you had to do some renovation of the room, maybe $80,000 or $85,000 worth, and the, the center decided to borrow that money, so $20,000 a year over five years. The total payments to the vendor, if you own, is zero. You're paying the lease over $300,000 a year. If you use, and we estimate about a day and a half of revenue, it, annually it's 186000 almost 500 so 186000 and a half is going to the vendor. The interesting part is the net at the end. If you own, it's about $1.8 in this example. If you use, it's a little over $2 million. So for the vendor, they're seeing annual revenue of about $186,500, rounded out. Over seven-year useful life, a total of $1.3 million, about what they wanted for the equipment, actually a little bit more. And they never have to sell you again if they replace in seven years. You just know that's going to happen. They get the tax benefit of owning the pet CK. They get to write off the expenses. They depreciate the equipment, all of that. And, they, and the equipment is kept current, thus increasing its resale value. So the vendor can take it out at the appropriate time and put it right out into use, either as a, something they sell or a lease or whatever they would do in the secondary market. And pet CT service remains in the seller's hands, which is really important for their quality initiative. For the user, person providing the clinical services, no upfront capital outlay, no annual service or maintenance fee, you receive regular updates, and on average you would change out the equipment every seven years. And your annual net revenue is different from the lease of about $241,000. And over the life, over that seven year life, you will have given back to the medical center the amount of, the, of what you would have gotten on the lease side plus another 1 point, almost $1.7 million in additional revenue. Not a bad deal for putting nothing in up front. You don't own the equipment for certain, but why would you want to after seven years? The new model is a win-win for the vendor and for the user, and it's going to be required if we're all going to be successful in this environment. I know that was a lot to cover in a fairly short amount of time, and I want to thank you for listening today. If you'd like to talk to me outside of this area, uh, my email address on the bottom, I'd be glad to set up a time to chat. I'm always happy to do that. I learn from you, and hopefully you'll learn from me. Thank you again. Wayne, excellent presentation. Uh, thank you very much. We've got some questions in from the audience. And uh, if for those of you out there want to use the chat or the question feature, on the uh, go to webinar interface to ask Wayne any questions. Uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, Wayne, uh, we, the first one that came in is, uh, you know, do you know of any companies that are offering this type of program um, and, and does it work? It does work. Um, I'm aware of two companies right now. There's one in the UK that's doing this across a broad line of equipment. They'll, you know, they'll do CTMR, almost anything, and it's a seven-year program. The equipment gets changed out seven years, 
and um, they maintain ownership, and it seems to be working well for them and for the uh, service providers, the uh, people that are providing the clinical services. Here in the States, I'm aware of one company that's starting to do this. It's a company that specializes in nuclear medicine. They're called um, Universal, uh, Universal uh, Medical Resources, and they provide uh, nuclear medicine imaging devices, and they're doing it, and it works for them, and it works for their clients. I guess, Wayne, on the other side of it, there's a question about, you know, are there any circumstances in which you would not suggest using a program like this? Well, I alluded to it earlier in the talk. Um, if you have low throughput, if, if you just don't have good throughput for whatever it is you're doing, I wonder why you'd look at buying a piece of equipment or why anyone would want to provide you a piece of equipment. You have to have not robust throughput, but a pretty steady and reasonable rate of revenue generation to make this program work. If you were really low, I, I would say don't buy equipment, don't lease it, don't you know, don't try to get an arrangement like this. Try to boost your throughput. So some, someone, uh, I think, read your mind here. Says, you know, what if at some point during the use period, the use time, uh, that we decided that we wanted to change from use to own? Is that something that a program like this would offer? That's a great question. Um, that's something you'd want to build in at the start of the relationship. And so the vendor... And for you, you need to have it on the table so that they know that that's a possibility and you know it's a possibility. And let's face it, today hospitals are being sold and imaging centers are being sold. All kinds of things are happening. And whether that relationship would make sense as part of the sale of that equipment or the closing of a hospital, whatever, is unknown uh, um, up front. But that's a risk that both the, the user of the equipment and the vendor need to look at. And I would say build it in right at the start of the relationship. But if you decided to buy it, I question why the vendor wouldn't sell you the equipment. They certainly know the equipment, and it would make it would make a lot of sense to have it stay in place. Wayne, one of the uh, viewers uh, of the web, today's webinar sent in uh, something that you and I have chatted about in preparation for this webinar. Uh, and Bill says, and "This sounds a lot like a zero down lease. Uh, you know, how does this uh, profile differ?" Well, uh, it, it, is, it is a lot like a zero driveway car lease. It's a lot like that. You don't pay anything. Uh, the difference is that no one's asking you at the end of seven years to come up with $200,000. There isn't a, a, a balloon payment at the end, if you will, like there is with a three-year lease where you drop the car off, pay $12,000. No one's asking you to put any money up front. But the concept is very similar. When you... When you drive around today and you go to look at places like uh, Automax and other places that are just full to the perimeter of their lot with really great looking two, three year old cars, those were all lease cars. And people, I think, are looking at automobiles and asking themselves, why do I want to spend all this money, take money out of my bank account or have a very large car loan when, in fact, I could do something less on a monthly basis and make use of my available um, income uh, for other things. And this is very much the same. How do we free up that capital to do other things and still get access to what we need? And so it, it, it's, um, it's an interesting observation. It's a lot like that, but you don't pay anything at the end. You get a new piece of equipment at the end. That's a, that's a great question, Bill. Thank you. And for those out there who may have other questions, uh, please use the, the question uh, chat type feature on GoToWebinar. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly address them. We've got a couple more uh, questions that we received during the presentation uh, before we wrap it up. Um, you know, with, with things changing constantly in healthcare, Wayne, you, you noted that in the early part of the presentation. Um, if, if a provider hit a point where they might need to end this relationship or end their participation, you know, would they be able to do something like that? Again, it's, it's something you want to build into the agreement when you start. The vendor, of course, is going to look at that and see it as a risk, but I think if you're upfront about it and just say you don't know of anything happening like that, if you sincerely don't, uh, but you want to know that should you need to break the relationship, I mean partnerships start that way, and the first thing the partners worry about is not what they're going to be doing every day, but how they dissolve the partnership. This is sort of like that. You need to have a way to do that should circumstances change for the vendor or you that the partnership needs to be dissolved. So I would say right at the beginning, address it and have some language that make, make you comfortable. And I, I think it probably is more than doable. 
And you mentioned the vendors. There, there's the one in the UK and, and of course, the one in the US with Universal Medical that you mentioned. But the vendor's taking on some risk with this type of program as well. Absolutely. The vendor's taking on risk, and, and that's why it's up to you, to the user, uh, the one who wants the equipment, to make sure that they've, that they've lessened that risk, that they've demonstrated historical throughput, uh, historical revenue generation. The vendor needs to look at it and ask one question. It's sort of like it's sort of like if you're buying a house, the bank says, how much money do you make? Because they want to make sure you can do one thing, pay the mortgage. And they don't want the mortgage to be so high that it takes your entire income because they know that's a, that's a losing proposition for you and for them. Here, like I said, it should be around 10% or less of your monthly revenue that goes to this user fee. If, if you have enough throughput to do that, the risk for the vendor is pretty low. But there is risk for the vendor always, and there is risk for the vendor in leasing equipment and doing all kinds of things. There's always risk. But it's up to the user to demonstrate that that risk is low.